Uh, good morning, folks, and uh, thanks for coming to this session on uh, social TV, multi-platform engagement, and uh, connected TV. Um, my name is uh, Richard Castelline. I'm the CEO of Agora Media Innovation, an integrated agency in the UK, and uh, the publisher of AppMarket.TV, which is an online source for news and opinion on social TV, TV apps, transmedia, and connected TV. I'd like to start with a couple of headlines from, from, uh, from App Market TV over the past uh, year uh, to add some brevity to this. Um, there was a recent UK report that says 80% of UK teens use second screen uh, devices to communicate with friends while watching television. And a similar uh, report out of the US had 75% of 18 to 24 year olds regularly browse the internet while watching TV. So what we're really seeing here is a shift in consumer behavior, uh, definitely with the youth. The future is here. Early adopters may be the youth, as they usually are with emerging technologies, but the rise of the tablet is what I like to call a game changer for those who, of us that have played in the fields of social TV for a few years. There has been resistance. There will be more resistance, but those who resist are those who will likely find themselves on the losing side, similar to when the internet tore through newspapers, magazines, and music. And now the challenge for television is, similar to what happened in those industries as the internet comes into play in the living room. Um, I'd like to start with some demos. Uh, so let's start with J uh, David Julian from Endemol. Could everyone on the panel quickly introduce themselves before their demo? Hello, everyone. I'm David Julian, responsible for digital gaming at Endemol International. Um, hello. Good morning, just to be sure that everybody's up. Uh, I'm Patrice Lipovsky from Orange, and I'm in charge of uh, digital innovation and communities. My name is uh, Dan Saunders. I'm head of content services for Samsung Europe. Hi, uh, my name is Tom McDonnell. I'm commercial director of Monterosa based in London. Uh, you won't have heard of us, but we'll explain a little bit more later. <laughs> my name is uh, Yvonne Elfig. I'm co-founder and CEO of Ex Machina in Amsterdam and San Francisco. Probably also haven't heard of us, but hopefully after today it will have changed. David, would you like to uh, start with your demo, please? Yep. So I will uh, briefly talk about connected content uh, with an MDMOL. It works now. First slide. It's coming in a minute. OK. No. So um, at Endemol, uh, we started uh, connected content many years ago uh, with uh, Big Brother, uh, where uh, people could influence the outcome of the show. And now uh, we are working a lot to uh, try to put the interactivity within the program and constantly allow the audience to influence the show and play along as well uh, within the show which uh, we started last year with a new show called The Money Drop. And so I will play now the video to show you how it works. So you can go with the video, please. This is The Million Pound Drop Live. The Million Pound Drop Live is a revolutionary new game show for Channel 4. The format combines TV and web into a seamless experience. For the first time in a game show, we give viewers the chance to play along with the TV contestants from their homes. Here's how it works. At the start of every show, viewers are prompted to visit the Play Along game on the official website. If you think you're better than the players in the studio, then prove it! Viewers are given a virtual £1 million and face the same questions as the TV contestants. When the contestants are asked to place their money, players at home do the same, experiencing every nail-biting moment of the show simultaneously. Players have the option to tell us more about themselves, such as age, gender, and location. This data is fed back into the show, allowing the host to compare how different people from around the UK are doing compared to the TV contestants. 476 people are still in play with their initial one million pounds. Players can even log in via Facebook to compete against their friends.
they can brag about their score by posting it to Facebook and Twitter. This greatly increases buzz, helping to keep the show trending on Twitter and prompts players' friends to challenge them. Numbers peaked at 189,000 people playing during a single show. That's 8.6% of the TV audience, a record for a play-along game. 83,000 scores were shared via Facebook during the second series, which drove an additional 73,000 visits to the game. And a total of 1.3 million people played along over the first two series. Broadcast Magazine said that Channel 4's exercise in convergence is a masterpiece of innovation. The million pound drop play along game transforms passive viewers into active participants with their every action feeding back into the live program. Playing along makes an already entertaining show totally gripping. Yeah, so you see that there are mainly regarding connected content, connected shows, two axes. One, you allow the TV audience to influence the show, and second, you allow the TV audience to play along within the show. Um, and then you, you keep these data, whether it's polls, whether it's game statistics, and you use it to enrich the show itself. I'm going to show you briefly uh, the online interfaces we used internationally to roll out a uh, display along game for the money drop. So here, that's what the TV audience sees. It's a countdown before the show on TV starts to, to get ready. You can see that the people can fill in a form about gender, about date of birth, about location, so that then we can, while the show is aired, we can consolidate those, stat, those data and push it on TV and online as well. So this is, this is what we're going to do for the Little Dance next week. This is the interface for the US. As well, online, we push the statistics, the live player statistic online as well, as you can see. This is what is in Germany now, in Spain, in Hungary, in Israel. And for the UK, which was the first country where this play-along game was released, Tom will tell you more about this one. That's uh, clearly that's the, the most performing uh, show and play-along game so far. So of course, uh, you watch TV and then you, you interact live with, this, uh, with the program using whatever device you want, your remote control, your laptop, your smartphone, your tablet, whatever, for a live or pre-recorded show. And the benefits, of course, first is for the TV audience, for uh, our clients, uh, and the benefits as well is for the TV show itself. We, we, we really want to, to, to put connect, connected uh, features uh, inside a show, inside its DNA. And as well, uh, of course, we want to create uh, user engagement and create fans for tomorrow, prepare the monetization of this uh, connected audience. So now, I will leave. Thanks. This Thanks, David. Uh, in fact, I don't need that for, because for the last 15 years, I've been doing demos on stage in events, etc. And I've been missing them because, uh, you know, when nothing can, uh, can fail, everything is failing. So now I'm coming with videos. So it's perfect. It works well. I hope it works. Can we have the first videos? The first video, please. And then the video is not starting. Yes, it is. So uh, the first one is about 2424 Actu, which is our news aggregator on four screens. And Anywhere and at any time. With 2424 Actu by Orange, this is now possible. 2424 Actu gives you a complete overview of international, political, economic, sports, and entertainment news at all times. At home or on the go, 2424 Actu mobile apps keep you up to date all day long with the hottest news on your iPad, iPhone, Android smartphone, or tablet. Access breaking news from TV, radio, or print media at all times, thanks to our 50 partners. Treat yourself to a fresh experience on the iPad with 2424 Act2 News Browsing. Developed especially for iPad, our app lets you browse quickly through 16 essential headlines. Easily access many videos, radio clips, and news articles, all sorted by topic and taken from the best and most trusted French and international media brands. Whether you're in your living room, relaxing, or on the move, 2424 Actu offers both a comprehensive press review 
and an in-depth coverage of the stories that interest you. 2424F2, news from every angle. Well, the, the idea uh, which is behind that is that uh, we, uh, we, we definitely want to be present you know, on each of the four screens uh, with an experience which is adapted to the screen. So uh, it is something which is key. Um, I think the main problem we, ha we have with that so far is uh, that it costs a lot to be present with a dedicated experience, but we're working on that. Um, and uh, I think that the, the, the customer deserves something which is adapted to his needs and to the way he wants to consume your, your application. The second example I want to give you is definitely opening the road to social TV. Uh, it's a new application. It's, it's the first time which is being uh, shown. Uh, so don't tell everybody that I'm showing this since I've been stealing the videos. Uh, but um, don't take pictures. Uh, it is something about engagement, so maybe we can start the video. Um, this uh, social TV application uh, is called TV Check, and uh, it starts, uh, maybe some of you are familiar with other social TV uh, applications, so you're just connecting through Facebook uh, from your iPhone, and then you can directly discover some uh, uh, popular shows on TV. Uh, and then you can immediately see, as it is the case on Foursquare, who's the mayor, who's the master, uh, who is currently uh, watching uh, the shows which are live on TV. So we're just scanning, uh, using the EPG and scanning the whole thing. You can search for a certain kind of uh, programs, for instance, you can uh, uh, type in uh, words uh, like uh, Tele, uh, and then you will find all the all the programs which are starting with uh, tele, for instance, uh, tele food, tele shopping, etc. Uh, then you're clicking and you have uh, the, the, I would say, what you can expect on the, on the EPG. Uh, then you can also um, uh, get into the details of the program uh, and you can, uh, um, then you're in front of the TV, you can use the automated check-in just to say that you're watching something. So you just point out, and we are going to recognize automatically the program you're watching. Uh, then you're, you're, you're winning some points, uh, and uh, with the points, you're entering a certain, a certain game around TV, uh, which is about getting some badges, etc. So of course, you can see what your friends are doing. Uh, this is the most important part because everybody wants to have a shared experience. Everybody wants to not to be the only one to see something. And uh, this is the, the, what you can do by just reviewing what your friends are currently doing, uh, socializing with them, um, determining what's popular uh, through Facebook. You have some badges, uh, which are things you can earn by, uh, by playing the game. Uh, and then you can see uh, the profile of your friends or your profile, uh, trying to determine, for instance, that you're the master, which is the equivalent of the mayor of a certain program or a certain show uh, of a certain uh, TV channel, and uh, people can expect that uh, they will be featured uh, in the show they like, etc., etc. So this is the little things I wanted to show you. Your turn. Thank you. Um, so um, many people may wonder why uh, a company like Samsung uh, would be at a show um, such as MIP TV. Um, within Samsung, what's happened over the last two to three years is that uh, the majority of our television sets and of course our smartphones and recently launched tablet devices all come with software engines uh, which enable content providers um, to provision their services using application-based technology to our devices. Samsung is, as far as I'm aware, the only major brand manufacturer that currently is producing televisions, PCs, tablets and smartphones. So. We're in quite a privileged position in that we do get to understand the full converged ecosystem of devices within the living room, uh, and as well as in home, also out of home as well. My particular focus at the moment is on uh, uh, television and television applications. Uh, but as you can guess, as things move forward, uh, we have increasing amounts of work to do in the tablet and the smartphone space as well. The sorts of services that we've launched over the last couple of years have mainly been uh, focused on uh, terrestrial catch-up services uh, and some of the key video-on-demand services uh, within territories across Europe. 
Uh, so we have partnerships, for example, with uh, BBC in the UK for their iPlayer service, uh, Love Film also in the UK, Orange in France, uh, Antenna Tre in Spain, uh, Telecom Italia in Italy. And what you can see developing uh, within Samsung, and I guess also with all major manufacturers across Europe, is uh, the beginnings now of a, a slightly more mature environment in which most of the killer applications uh, that are delivering video-based content are beginning to make themselves present on these television devices. It's not just about video on demand, however, and we see very compelling use cases for other sorts of service delivered through application-based technology. A good example for, is uh, Flickr, uh, the photo sharing website, or Picasa as well. And another compelling use case that we've developed very recently is Skype uh, on your TV. So we have a, a small a camera, a microphone module uh, that sits very nicely on the top of the television set and allows you to do Skype from the comfort of your uh, armchair or your sofa in the living room. In September of last year, we ran uh, a, an application contest uh, for television in the UK, France and Germany with a total prize fund of half a million euros. Uh, and so what we've now got is the beginnings of uh, developers outside of the traditional broadcast <coughs> telco video on demand community actually also beginning to build applications for TV. Within the social space, we've had applications like Twitter and uh, uh, Facebook available on TVs for a couple of years now. One of the things that you'll notice about our 2011 product, which is going to launch into market within the next uh, couple of weeks, uh, depending upon the country in which you live, is that we've begun to provision uh, social networking apps such as Twitter and Facebook side by side with linear broadcast, which is uh, a first, I believe. So I think we'll debate this a little bit later on as we, as, as we go about whether that's the correct context for such services. But really what you're seeing from the manufacturers now is an iterative process. We understand that even the, even the product that we have in the market today needs refining, needs improving. But what you're seeing from us each year is, is step changes. So significant uh, maturity, significant growth in understanding of how best to deliver these services within the context of television, tablet, and smartphone devices. Thanks, Dan. Um, I'm going to have to use this. If I could have the first slide, thank you. Um, so I, I'm going to tell you a bit about Monterosa at the end. Um, uh, you've seen a bit of our work um, in David's video um, already. Um, so I, I noticed that none of you have responded to my request. <laughs> interesting. No. Well, oh, okay. Well, okay. We should, we should leave by maybe, maybe. Perhaps I'm the only one okay. speaking English. <laughs> okay, this is interesting. <laughs> There's still some people. I tell you what, if you all stand up, including me, I'll give 100 <coughs> euros to UNICEF right now. Everybody? It has to be everybody, though, because if everybody doesn't stand up, it's... There's still three still, people yeah, sitting. So if you can't stand up, it's not a problem. If you're, you know, hungover or, <laughs> you know, I, I know there's some wobbly <laughs> legs this morning. <laughs> okay, can we see anyone still sitting down? Anyone sitting? That's great, fantastic. There's a hundred euros, Richard. Yes. Can you please see that that goes not in your pocket? <laughs> <laughs> okay, what's that all about? Um, I, I'm trying to make a point here, really, which is that. Um, <laughs> Quite Which an is expensive point. an expensive point. It's my own money as well. Um, <laughs> my point is that persuasion is a major factor in the success of some of the things that we're going to talk about here. Not just in a marketing sense, um, but in a, in a communicating to your audience sense. And of course, that's um, the business that we're all in. Um, it's interesting to see that some of you um, stood up when I asked you to. Pretty much none of you stood up when the message was put on the screen. Um, and then when I persuaded you and finally made you feel really guilty for not standing up with the 100 euro UNICEF thing, everybody stood up. So there's a little bit of guilt involved. That's a unique way of persuading you to do what I wanted you to do. Um, but the point I'm trying to make is that no matter how good the experiences or the applications or whatever it is that we're creating for the future, no matter how good those things are, there's a huge gap between the existence of that thing and getting everybody to do it. 
Um, and that's something that we at Montrose have learned a lot about over our, our eight years um, in trying to persuade TV audiences to get connected with our, our shows. Um, if you look at this graph here, um, sorry, I did promise not to use any graphs in this, but I had to use this one. This, this shows some of the dual screen experiences that we've been part of over the last few years. And you can see um, that when we worked with the BBC and Fremantle on The Apprentice in March 2009, we thought we had a great conversion rate. 0.2% of the audience participated in this play-along game. 30-something um, thousand people, we thought, wow, fantastic, brilliant. Um, and then we worked with uh, Living, which is now Sky Living in the UK, um, with a, a new show called Four Weddings. That converted 1.4% of the audience. And we thought, wow, this is interesting. Is it just time that's generating more response, or is it because people are being persuaded better to do it? And I think there are reasons behind that that we can come on to later. But then, of course, you see these two much more impressive conversion rates. When we worked with Endemol and Channel 4 to create a truly integrated format, I say create, we create the play-along game, they created an integrated show, and we worked together on that. This is, this is what you see. 4.5% was the best conversion rate we saw in Series 1. And then Series 2, without really much happening in between, we saw almost a doubling of the peak response rate. So that, to me, says that creative integration is driving response and also general awareness of this mode of operation, this, this way that you can play TV um, is sort of infiltrating people's consciousness. Um, so these are, these are some of the stats, slightly different to the ones that um, David showed because they're measuring over a different period of time, but 785 <coughs> unique users over six shows. That's, that's in the scheme of sort of marketing figures, that might seem small, but when you look at some of the um, registered user numbers of some of the social check-in apps, actually, um, I read a story about one, one of the CEOs of one of those, those companies boasting about 900,000 users that they've got. Well, this TV show achieved almost that within six shows, um, and the amount of time that people spending, uh, are spending with these things is also increasing. Um, so very quickly, this is another graph, I'm sorry. But look at, look at what you can generate from one screen to the other. With a really persuasive call to action, you can see that second big call to action generating a huge response in the audience. People are getting their laptops out and they're doing something because the person on screen is persuading them to do it. Um, maybe they're showing a screenshot of the thing, maybe they're just telling them how great it is, it doesn't matter. Um, and you can see some less effective calls to action after that, um, making the point that the quality of the persuasion, of course, is, uh, is, is very relevant here. Um, so I'm just going to leave you with this before we carry on. Um, if you're really inspired by this session, which I, I'm not suggesting you definitely will be, but if you are inspired and you want your own two-screen idea, we've made this little uh, game here which you can play. Um, you just hit a button and it gives you your pitch. So as you walk out of this room, if you find a nice commissioning editor or um, somebody interesting acquiring your format, there's your idea. And we're not asking for royalties. Thank you. Okay. Come to the next slide, please. Oh. Um, well, bonjour. My name is uh, Jeroen. I'm from Ex Machina in, uh, in Amsterdam. Um, basically, we've uh, got a background in the uh, gaming and internet space. We've been building large-scale multiplayer games uh, for companies like uh, Electronic Arts and uh, Microsoft Xbox. Uh, but we've always had a lot of customers in the media space as well, particularly broadcasters and uh, production companies. And um, uh, increasingly, we were interested in, in, in taking these large-scale multiplayer experiences and, and linking them to TV shows. So not just taking a TV property and turning it into a game that you could play on a website or on your mobile phone, uh, but also to play them uh, synchronously. Um, so that's what we've been working on the past couple of years. Um, and uh, we've done a few, uh, few of these projects now in the, in the last couple of months with the latest um, platform that we've provided for this called uh, play to tv uh, This is a, a quiz show in the Netherlands. Um, it broadcasts once a year, so it's a one-off show. Um, and um, people could play along and to see how well they did, um, how much knowledge they had about the science uh, subjects raised in, uh, in this quiz. Uh, for the Dutch public broadcaster. A uh, project we're currently doing in, uh, in Germany um, for uh, Germany's Next Top Model. Uh, it contains a wide variety of uh, interactive components. I'll have a video uh, later on that uh, shows some of the, some of the features. 
Um, and this also has a real-time Facebook connection. So um, whatever your friends are doing um, while they watch the show, um, through the Facebook connection, you get, uh, get real-time uh, updates. Um, and uh, another big project that we've worked on for uh, Talpa in the <coughs> Netherlands um, is called The Voice of Holland, and it's now being uh, uh, licensed to many different countries across the globe. And we've made a video to show what uh, Play the TV platform is capable of uh, based on uh, uh, Voice of Holland footage. Basically, what we've done is we've created a lot of uh, interactive components that can be uh, used to create show or program-specific interactivity rather than the generic uh, social TV features that uh, Facebook and Twitter offer today. Uh, we offer this white label um, to production companies and, uh, and broadcasters. And my call to action, uh, as, as uh, we've seen in several cases here already, uh, my call to action is um, I invite you over to the uh, Experience Hub um, it's, it's a new formula here at uh, MIP TV where a lot of new innovations are shown, uh, also including Orange and Intel are there, and we have a hands-on um, live demo 
of this of this product. And uh, there's also a presentation um, where I'll, I'll talk about this subject uh, um, in more detail at uh, 3 p.m. So I hope to, uh, to see you there as well. Thank you. Um, can we have a round of applause for the demos, please? I think that's absolutely fantastic. So um, the internet is, uh, can, can be considered quite disruptive to uh, many broadcasters and content creators at the moment. We're entering a, a phase of disruption in the industry. Um, and things could change uh, in the next few years, uh, similar to what's happened in the music industry and the print industry. There's going to be a lot of change. But uh, multi-platform really offers a lot of opportunity for content creators and uh, broadcasters to, you know, uh, capture some of that revenue back and uh, create new engagement with, uh, with their viewers, I think. But I'd like to start with social TV. Um, the intersection of social media and the content industry um, as well as broadcasting, is expected to have a huge impact on consumer behavior, moving from the water cool at work conversations on what was on last night to real-time sharing during programs. So what is social TV? Um, what does it actually mean to you? Let's clear this up today. Um, uh, who would like to tackle this definition? Uh, Tom, would you like to have a crack at it? What's your definition of social TV? Um, off the top of my head, I think, I think what's interesting about this, this term is that it hasn't actually got a definition. It's like Web 2.0. When it was happening, when it was emerging, nobody really knew what it was. And it was only after the buzz had subsided that people could look back and then define it truly. So it's a I think it's a collection of things. And to directly steal your definition of it, Richard, I think it's the intersection of TV and social media. Um, anybody else like to have a crack at that? Um, I'd like to state that uh, TV has always been social. So uh, I think uh, uh, everybody's about getting a, a shared experience because uh, even if you've seen, uh, if you've seen uh, Titanic 20 times, the, the night it's, uh, it's on, the night you can see it on TV, you know that it is definitely something you can discuss uh, just after that with, with your friends, with the people, uh, with your colleagues at work, and everybody wants to see things that everybody's seeing. So as a matter of fact, TV is already social, uh, what is happening now is that uh, it's getting into the social networks, which is just distorting the, the, the relation people have with shows and TV. Jeroen? Well, to me what makes something social is that um, it wouldn't be the same if other people wouldn't be part of it. So if, if you could do something on your own and it would be um, as much fun or almost as much fun, it's not truly really social. Um, and uh, therefore, for instance, a multiplayer game is inherently social. Um, you cannot play it on your own. It's not even possible. And I think what we see now is that we take a lot of existing TV shows and we bolt social features on top. Um, but what's going to be more exciting is that if you create a new TV show, which is designed to be social from the ground up, it's designed for participation, um, and then um, things get truly social. So it's not an afterthought, but it's designed to be like it. Or maybe even a game. Uh, that is played online and is generating interesting data um, so you can turn it into a TV show as well. Okay. Um, David from uh, Endemol. I'm curious, uh, these, uh, this companion type TV or the multi-platform experience, um, is, this a, is this something specifically more or less for new shows or can you also see it picking up, helping you know, uh, pick up older inventories, you know, maybe <coughs> that's in a little bit of a slight decline? and raising it above in a competitive fashion. You know, maybe X, X Factor sliding down a little bit against something else and, uh, you know, is it, uh, how do you feel what, about the new, you know, the new formats versus the old ones? Are you doing any work with, to sort of revive some of the older formats <coughs> as well or is it specifically new? Let's say specifically new. We, we've been doing a lot of online applications for uh, our old shows, yeah. but it was standalone applications. Now for the new show, we focus on uh, connected features just like we, we are doing right now for the Modejo, which is a new format. And as well, we are uh, working to add new feature on existing formats, for example, for uh, Big Brother. What we, want to, what we want to do for Big Brother, and we, we started to test it uh, last week in France uh, in a reality show format, is just to allow the people to give live polls, live opinion. So yes, we, we are doing both. Okay, I suppose the rights issues are a little bit different between, the, well, I won't go into that, but um, so um, latest developments in apps. Uh, 
Let's talk about some of the things you might have seen in the last 12 months. We haven't talked a anything about what's going on in the States here yet. Uh, is there anything you see particularly interesting on the other side of the pond? Um, we have FISA, we have Milo, we have a lot of C to C play, uh, BDC plays, you know, rather than uh, coming through the broadcaster side, such as what's happening here. Uh, Mizo, Philo, uh, Starling.tv, there's various other uh, components. Have you been impressed by any of this, Tom, or what do you think about the social TV and multi-platform scene in the United States? Um, I think a lot of it is driven by VC-backed startups, so the potential for massive scale is a necessity and it has to be part of their business model. But that also creates problems for them because um, very rarely do they get the opportunity to truly integrate with a show itself. So they, they, they rely on um, word of mouth and the proliferation of an app rather than the big call to action from TV. So although the experience of Miso can be quite good fun, I think I, in their shoes I would be quite concerned about how it was going to drive significant uptake of it without the power of the big screen. Okay. Um, a little bit about apps running on connected TV. Uh, this is the Samsung space. Uh, my, my, a lot of people are questioning since the iPad came out, uh, will this work? Um, single screen TV apps took a bit of a hit when the, when the, when the iPad came out because suddenly uh, a lot of people started looking at the reality of a multi-screen experience that was a bit more interesting than a mobile phone. Um, companies such as NDS and others, uh, they really moved hard from creating single screen TV widgets into the second screen, uh, into, the, into the two screen experience. So will, will consumers primarily use apps on the big screen or, vers, uh, or the second screen or will it be a combination of both? <coughs> That's the question. Can apps really be used comfortably in a 10 foot lean back experience? Are they better suited to a tablet or smartphone when engaging in interactive TV? And I'd like to send this one over to Dan. Yeah, I, th I mean, I wouldn't say that single screen apps had taken a hit. Um, mm. I think actually what we see now is um, something of a virtuous circle in that, um, so when we first started, as Samsung first started talking to, um, sorry, we use the co word content providers and to Samsung content provider means broadcaster, telco, video on demand provider, everyone. It's just our, um, our sort of a special way of talking about you guys. Um, what, we, um, what, what we realized when we first went out into the marketplace is we were, we were trying to talk to people about doing deals for both uh, content on television and content on mobile at the same time. And often what we found to be the case was that people were either focused on television as their main screen or on mobile. And, uh, and, uh, and you know, with benefit of hindsight, that seems like a sort of a fairly obvious position. What the tablet device did, I think, is create a very intuitive stepping stone between uh, television and mobile, between in-home and out-of-home experience. And uh, so th there's, a, there's a technology that um, is uh, called DLNA. Um, <coughs> uh, we give it a consumer name of uh, AllShare, which is essentially a kind of a, uh, a standard wireless protocol that all major manufacturers uh, adhere to. Uh, and it makes it uh, essentially a plug-and-play experience to be able to allow your tablet, your smartphone, and your television devices, and indeed other, other devices in the home, media servers and PCs, to talk together in a, in, in a really intelligent way. And so what we find now with um, uh, tablet devices in particular is that they create this really uh, nice intuitive bridge between uh, uh, you know, your social experience, your social television experience, which is the content that you share with uh, everyone else in the living room, and, and your personal content experience. So that might be, um, as you've seen some from, some, from some of the videos that have been uh, played today, it might be that you're using, therefore, your, uh, your tablet device in order to control your social networking uh, whilst uh, uh, watching video on demand through an application on your television set. So I think a, a lot of this is about um, the, the sort of the native or the correct context of the content as against the device. And what we're discovering is that whilst there are certainly uh, opportunities thrown up by convergent technology uh, which we hadn't thought of before, more often than not, the reality is, is that people already know what type of content they want to see on the different devices. And therefore, this isn't about competition between uh, uh, different devices in the home, but actually creating an ecosystem of devices in a way that means that you as a user have an intelligent uh, and seamless uh, experience. Excellent. If I may, uh Elaborate on, on this one. Uh, I would add uh, that um, interface is key. When you, you're mentioning this uh, 
single screen application. Uh, I'm sure that all of you have been traveling around the world and when you're in, in the hotel room and you find yourself in, fa in front of this little keyboard which is supposed to be controlling your TV. Uh, how many of you have used this keyboard in the hotel room? Oh, one guy here, okay, <laughs> thank you. So uh, this is the, just an explanation. When you want to, to get, uh, to find things on YouTube, etc., uh, you can do that with a remote control. So uh, it's because interfaces are going to evolve that we may have some single screen, big screen application. That's, that's, that's a really good point, actually. And, and, and there's also, um, so th th there's, there's other stuff going on within this as well, which, which is maybe slightly away from the applications world, but hopefully gives a sense of how and why users will begin to use devices together in this way. So, so one of the problems that we face as a manufacturer in, in designing our user interfaces is that we've got to the stage now where it's not just linear broadcast television that's being accessed through the television device, but non-linear and also content from media servers and other devices in the home. So the question becomes, you, you know, your, your television experience is still predicated on the remote control. How do you successfully navigate all of these new content options available to you? And there are a couple of different solutions here that are already in the marketplace. So, so one is to develop a, a high-end remote control, which is a touchscreen remote control, and look something similar to a smartphone. Uh, a, a second, and, and I think maybe a potentially more successful approach, is to say, well, why not actually build an application that allows your smartphone to be your remote control? Uh, and use DLNA technology, as I mentioned before, in order to create the user interfaces that you need in order to make these uh, uh, explorations of all of these different content sources uh, more viable. So we're seeing already that there are clear reasons just within the almost traditional television user experience why people would seek to create greater connectivity between tablet, smartphone, and television devices. Another fun use case which you'll see from Samsung uh, in the high-end television sets that we're bringing to market this year is that we put twin tuners into our high-end television sets and make it possible for you as a consumer to watch one channel on your television screen whilst channel hopping the other channels available to you on your smartphone or your tablet device. Okay. Tom, are you looking at connected TV at all or UV platform with, uh, coming out in the UK as a, as a route Absolutely. to market in the future? Yeah, I mean, we, <coughs> we see... We see that as part of the future, certainly not the whole future, but the, um, the, the techniques that we're developing um, to convert you know, passive audiences to active ones are going to be equally relevant on, on the big screen. Um, but I, I think the general consensus um, in, our, in our team is that it, there isn't one solution. It's not that all things are going to be on the big screen or the, or the personal device. There's certainly experiences that you want to be personal. I certainly don't want to be sharing my personal interactions with my friends with other people in the room, for instance. Yeah. So there's, the, the, I think, I think what, what's going to be interesting is how you marry up the capabilities of this device, that device, and the content itself, the TV show. Um, of course, it's not all about TV shows, but once, once a, a development producer knows what they can do with those devices and they know that 25% of people could participate in this way, that's when things get really exciting, I think. Okay. I think uh, one of the major problems I've heard from the application development community that I've heard is that the sheer multitude of actual platforms in the television market, um, Sharp is doing their, uh, Sharp, uh, Toshiba, Samsung, Sony, um, on and on and on, Toshiba, they're all doing their own SDKs and their own APIs and their own development platforms, which makes it quite difficult for, for developers to actually, you know, go, go across the line and come out on all, all TV sets. Uh, you ruin our... Um, <laughs> You've, seen, you've probably seen similar stuff in the, in the mobile space. Yeah. Um, you know, and how do you feel about this, this uh, sort of fragmentation in, in, in connected TV? Well, it's, it's horrible and it's going to bankrupt companies. Um, so um, I probably shouldn't be even on this panel because it's called multi-platform apps, right? And when we started out doing this, we were building apps, but we stopped doing that and we're building everything in HTML5. Um, so we, we, we follow web standards and I think that's the only, well, it's not the only, but it's right now the best way to, um, to get out of this uh, horrible mess of fragmentation. And we've seen mobile games companies spend up to 50% of their development budget uh, on porting alone, making sure it would run all the phones of all the different vendors and manufacturers. And, um, you know, it's the same thing. A lot of companies, they launch an iPhone app and they think they have a mobile strategy. 
Uh, well, that's not the case. Um, and think about it, if you're a TV company, you want people to participate. Um, and you have to spend five minutes on TV explaining what to do if you have an iPhone, go to the App Store if you're an Android, Windows Phone 7, Samsung Bada. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's a horrible mess. The, the best way, the internet, the URL, the U in URL stands for universal. Um, so that's, that's what it should be like. You recognize the device that somebody has and you give them uh, the appropriate content. Um, so, you know, it's great that you, you, you always get the best technology experience if you go native, if you build an app that fully utilizes the potential of the hardware that it's <coughs> running on. So you'll always see cutting edge stuff. But I think to, to reach the mass market, just like SMS has proven to be so successful because it works regardless if you have a Nokia or an iPhone uh, or a Samsung, it works across the board. And that's what we need for this as well. It needs to be ubiquitous and it needs to be universal. I, I would yeah. add to that. Oh, sorry. Yeah, please. I, would, I, I, would, I agree with all of that. And um, I think we have to get real about this stuff. You, you need to look at the business model and see who's paying for the work to be done, whether it's licensing software or paying for custom development. Um, somebody's footing the bill. And somebody's bill is going to get 10 times bigger if we have to do it 10 times. I mean, it's not as simple as that, but that's basically the situation we're in. So a broadcaster, for instance, who's investing X tens of thousands of pounds or dollars is not necessarily going to want to double that investment in order to reach an extra 2% of the audience. And we, we also have to bear in mind that the, the penetration of laptops, wireless laptops, is massive. So whilst we're all really excited about the cutting-edge stuff we can do with iPads, iPhones, smart, and all the rest of it that we're talking about, the laptop is still king. So we need to... Um, in my view, start there and then work out from that. Yeah, if I may add two, two sentences. Um, yeah, you, you're right about uh, HTML5. I mean, on the technical side being maybe one possibility to handle the fragmentation issue. But there is also a problem with um, uh, the, the um, I would say the, the company uh, running uh, the application store or platform uh, for which you can for instance, we have an, a little application which is just waiting for five weeks before it's getting validated and can hit the market. I won't give the name of the company which is based in the US and which is producing phones and tablets, but uh, it, it, we're just expecting a go. Uh, and, uh, and it is definitely something which is costing a lot to, uh, to have to integrate this kind of uh, delays in the, uh, in the development of, uh, of the applications. Uh, yeah, everyone, um, th there is a simple solution to this, which is everyone just goes out and buys a Samsung TV and a Samsung mobile, and then the, and then the problem is solved. Or you give us all. Oh, yeah, right, yeah, well, that's the, that is the option number two. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, uh, platform fragmentation is something that people like to um, uh, grumble about quite a lot. And I agree, you know, so clearly at the moment, the situation that we're in is, is unsustainable, and there will be over the coming years some consolidation, as, as you see in all markets uh, once they get going. But I think that there is a benefit to fragmentation as well, uh, and particularly uh, for uh, the content industry, the entertainment industry, as against technology industry, in that what fragmentation means is that there's um, competition out there. And competition does two things. First of all, it means that the conversations that the content community has with the technology community are sensible rather than one-sided. And secondly, it encourages innovation, which ultimately leads to uh, the best solution for the marketplace and for the consumer. So, so on the one hand, I think you're right. I think uh, developers do have a tough time at the moment in addressing all of those multiple different platforms. But from a consumer's point of view, consumers have never had it so good. And I think that's worth bearing in mind. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about monetization, David. Um, I think that... The music in, in the music industry, the recording, uh, the record labels have had to really, uh, they've really taken a hit over the past few years due to disruption in the music industry. And the music industry itself seems to be going more towards, you know, they're getting very creative in, in new ways to make money. Uh, merchandising, uh, some virtual stuff online, um, various other methods. I'm, I'm just curious as to what kind of opportunities in, in multi-platform in terms of gleaning revenue do you see for the content creators? That, that's, that's the question. Uh, that's a big question. You know, we, we are at the beginning of something. We're just beginning something, uh, talking about uh, connected TV. Uh, first, we need to demonstrate that people want to interact within a show. We think it is. That's the case, uh, considering the tests we've been running so far. Uh, so now we're creating audience, online audience, uh, with connecting programs. 
And now how do we monetize this audience? There are many ways. Uh, if you say, if you tell people, if you want to be, to, to be allowed to, to give your opinion on this show or on this uh, housemate, for example, if you, if you tell people it's one euro to be able to give your opinion, that's not the best way to monetize, of course. We, we think that first you create, you demonstrate the usage. Second, uh, you get the volume. Uh, but depending on uh, what you are offering uh, for the audience, then you will monetize or not. For example, uh, for the money drop, it's a play-along game. So when, when we do the, the play-along game, when people play uh, while they watch TV, we think it should be free by now for legal constraints and many questions and many other issues. But how do we monetize it? Sponsoring. That's, we, that's, what, we, that's what we hope. So that's, that's what we're trying to do. Okay. And we had some uh, experiences in some countries. In Hungary, we, we had a sponsor. We're going to have a sponsor as well in another country. Uh, and then the premium content could be uh, other usages, uh, standard version, apps within tablets, within uh, iOS and Android, and things like that. But we are learning. We are learning. We are uh, trying this, trying this, and see where the, where the audience would like to go. Anybody else like to touch that one? or? I, no? think, um, I think there's going to be lots of different revenue streams associated with, um, with connected content. Um, we're, we're all probably exploring at least some of them. Um, we, w one avenue that we're going down is to try and create measurable value against branded content. So if a show, um, if a show is funded by an advertiser, very often um, ad-funded shows are perceived to be valuable, but they're very difficult to value. Um, so if you can imagine that converting the, those passive um, potential customers into active ones is um, bringing people closer to your product, um, it, it opens the doors to um, all sorts of e-commerce opportunities, data capture, um, product insight, and such like. And when you put that all together, it can be quite attractive for a brand. So that, that might just be one way of, of, of going. Speaking of data capture, it's kind of like the 600-pound gorilla in the room that nobody really talks about. But as Facebook has proven online, um, data is, is hugely valuable. Uh, and for the first time, the broadcast industry and content creators are, uh, they have, a, well, not the first time, but they have a, a real strong two-directional situation where they're able to capture data via cookies and various uh, other methods, both on connected TV and also on second, uh, second screen uh, devices that are interacting with the TV. Um, what do you think about the data? Uh, you want to answer that? Yeah, just one, one, one word on monetization. While we were discussing with okay. David just before the session, uh, I was showing him a TV check, and uh, he was telling me something that everybody can figure as a very direct monetization way. Uh, if I'm watching Mad Men season one, episode three, and I'm just publishing it through TV check on Facebook, then I can have a deal which is uh, my friend pays nothing or pays half the price because we're going to have a, a shared experience. This is definitely the type of things we're going to try through social TV. Or rewarding alpha users, people that make so many reviews might get a free movie perhaps along yeah. those lines? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 What, what about the data situation? Do you have an opinion on that? Or? Oh yeah, you, you, you're right. That's the, that's the uh, pocket of gold at the end of the rainbow. Um, I mean, I, I think if, if, if you look at companies like Zynga in the social gaming space, they perfected this. Um, and I think that's also one of the reasons that, we're, um, it, that we launched this not really as a, as a product, but rather as, as a service. For instance, Germany's next top model, every week we change it. So the experience is slightly improved every week. And uh, that's the same thing we've seen with, um, uh, for instance, Playfish, which is a company I, 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 I highly admire. Uh, it's been acquired by, by EA. And um, some of their games have had over 100 releases over their lifetime. So every, every week or so, they, they add some new features. And then they hire the, the, the brightest and smartest mathematicians that they can find, statisticians. And they analyze all that data. So a game designer can come up with this great idea for a new feature. Um, but then if the, if the, if the guys that, that crunch the numbers say, well, it's not working, they take it out again. Um, and, and I think we'll start seeing that approach um, to, to connected apps, to connected services around TV shows. Um, and I think they'll be very evolving, and, and, and the money, the value is in, in the profile, in the behavior, and, and also personalizing the experience. Um, I showed you a quick product placement example in, in the demo, and we're, we're starting to experiment with it now. But of course, if you have a supermarket ad, um, 
if you're a male or female, you can get a different offer. If you live in a different part of the country, depending on your age. Uh, and, and this is actually stuff that, that will drive to higher convergence uh, and there, or conversion and, and, and therefore to higher perceived value. So yeah, definitely that's where the money's at. Okay. Um, the interesting question I have is who owns that data? <laughs> in terms of IP uh, ownership, it's an interesting uh, question, I suppose. As developers, you're bringing in the technology to capture the, the data. Is that, maybe that's a tough question, but is that a point of contention at all? Or, or don't, nobody wants to answer? <laughs> it's a negotiation. It's a negotiation. It's between all the parties yeah. on, every single, <laughs> okay. um, on every single deal. From, from the manufacturer's point of view, it's, it's quite clear to us. So we're... Um, uh, uh, frankly, it's not really our problem, I don't think. So, so I mean, the way that the, the, the deals that we structure and the way that we see ourselves working within the space is that we'll provide the hardware and the software platform and, and the content provider or the app developer provides their end-to-end -end service. So it's, it's the content provider's customer, it's the app developer's customer, and therefore we're not seeking to, uh, to take, a st take a stake in that game. Okay, um, I want to remind everybody after this, uh, this event today to go upstairs for the 360. Uh, there's going to be a, a pitching event upstairs with some multi-platform and some great technology. So um, I was asked by Fairhand to, uh, to remind everybody that uh, that's taking place after this. Um, well, last thoughts, anyone? I'm running out of questions. <laughs> Perhaps uh, I should sing something? Or yes. Yeah? <laughs> First I was afraid I was... No. <laughs> This is the first time a moderator gets out of question. You can ask for anything you like. We're here. Yeah. <laughs> let's let's take some audience questions from the audience. Yeah, yeah, that would be great. Does anybody have any questions? This gentleman, which is the only one who have uh, used the keyboard in the hotel room. <laughs> How are you? Um, I, this is a question uh, for you two gentlemen, primarily on the end. And you were discussing the the um, sort of consolidation and the, mod and the standardization of applications and being able to share information over cell phones without having to identify each one, something like SMS. And I, recently, obviously, we realized with the tablet uh, from Apple that they don't want to use Flash because it's, you know, it's a data, it's a, it's a hog on processing. So you have companies like that who are also making decisions about how we interact with the market. And I wanted to know if there is any sort of solution in your mind that would really standardize it. Because as I sit here and listen, I hear what you're saying, but then we have companies like Apple who just can stomp on something and then, you know, their foot's covered in that, in that idea and then you have to move on to the next. And everything that works right now, like SMS, uh, is very simple. You know, it's very, very, you know, very simple digital stuff. So how do you create that rich experience in a standard platform across all of these devices? Well, I've, if, if I can answer that, that's, um, my, my answer to that would be um, to, to go for the most open, but also at the same time, richest uh, experience or standard you, you, you can find. And as a lot of companies have been investing in Flash, and then the iPad came out, as you point out, and none of your fancy websites work on, on an iPad. Um, but if, you've, if you would have built it in, in HTML5 um, or HTML and JavaScript, which, because that's basically what it comes down to, what you need as a, as, as a developer, uh, it would have still worked. And, um, and, and that's my, my advice. Um, if you do that today, you can make a rich um, multimedia experience. You can put video in it. It can have real-time large-scale communication with the server, and it can run on iPhone, it can run on Android, it can run on BlackBerry version 6, it can run on PC, it can run on Mac. Um, of course, you still want to, um, that, that's got to do more with the user experience point of view. You don't want to have the same interface, perhaps, on all these devices, because you go from a very small screen to a very big one. But you can have uh, a common technology standard for it. But I think more importantly is that these, um, uh, these services, they run, the, try to put as much complexity on the server side of things, on the internet itself, so it become more of a window to it rather than a very complex, um, bulky uh, app that you know is megabytes worth of downloads and people never bother to, to upgrade it, so you're stuck to a, to a version that um, is no longer current. So that would be my advice to, um, to that. I think um, my, my perspective on it is that currently um, a lot of the activity around social TV, which is tagged onto TV, is uh, a cost rather than a revenue driver. It's starting to drive revenue, and we're part of that. But when, when we know what 500,000 users engaged for half an hour during a show is worth, 
will then be able to look at whether it's worth investing in the next platform in order to get another 50,000 users. So it'll, it'll become quite a, a simple um, financial commercial decision, I think. Um, we got time for one last question in the front here. Oh, sorry, I'll be quick so you can maybe ask another. Now, I just wanted to come back to this f fantastic uh, sort of uh, stand-up uh, stuff you, you, you started with, Tom. Um, my, my feeling, my question is, uh, okay, here it works because at the end of the, uh, of the process, it turns out that, okay, this is for UNICEF. Uh, don't you fear that if you do that, uh, on, on a sort of uh, you know mechanical basis on, on a TV show, for example, and it turns out in the end that it's just you know to sell a piece of soap or a piece of something or to ask people you know to uh, the the the, the uh, uh, it will dem demonetize itself you know so, so to speak this sort of call yeah. to action. I mean, how do you handle that you know question of not not you know um, uh, screwing people too 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 often? I think it's a, a very fine line, and I think we have to be very careful that what you're, what you're offering people is not some sort of commercial opportunity. You're offering them entertainment or enhanced entertainment, and they need to understand that that's the primary reason for them to go there. I think we, you know, if the entertainment was buying, so if it was a shopping channel, that's different. But people have to, the, the value to the user or to the audience has to be something tangible for me. So I think it's, I think it's a very fine creative line that we have to be careful to, uh, not to step over. Okay, folks, we're out of time. Uh, I'd like to remind everybody to head upstairs for the pitching uh, contest at Content360 and the Super Session, which are also upstairs and related to multi-platform apps. Uh, thank you very much for your time and uh, enjoy your day.